Okay, I hope you had lunch and uh, you're now ready to uh, fall asleep. Uh, I see someone are finishing lunch, that's totally fine. Um, so, for those of you who actually came here to um, listen to the uh, decomposing Java applications talk, that's the correct room, Spring Boot is the other one. Um, my name is Milen Jankov, um, and I work for LifeRay. And I'm um, just going to start with a quick question. Like, how many of you have ever heard used LifeRay? All right, a few people. All right. Um, so my role at LifeRay is developer advocate, which basically means I go to events like this or meet customers, meet developers and developer teams and trying to figure out in which way we can best help them to deliver solutions, software solutions. Um, for those of you who are familiar with LifeRay, you may recall that uh, it, is, it is a platform, like, uh, uh, sorry, a, a portal, and this is what it historically used to be. Um, and uh, it, things obviously have changed and evolved over the years. Um, so for just to keep you confused, we still call the main product LifeRay Portal, but it's more of a platform, and this is what I would call it here. But apart from that, we have a bunch of other things uh, these days, all kinds of frameworks uh, in this front end space or in the uh, like cloud and, and stuff like that. And I'm not going to bother you with all those. Um, I'm going to be um, doing some stuff that is kind of related to the platform, but it's not, not really um, to demo the platform itself. So the issue with the platform is that every time I go to talk to people about it, and they ask me, so what it is? Like, what, what, what does it do? And I'm like, well, we provide a platform for services, so people can build and consume services. And then people go, oh, yeah, sure, you do microservices. Uh, no. Uh, so SOA, uh, no. Uh, oh, so uh, well, like function, what is it called now? Serverless, uh, no. And, and what I realize is there's always this attempt to whatever you do, you have to make it so that it fits in a buzzword, right? If your software product doesn't fit in a buzzword, it's like you can't explain it anymore, uh, right? Um, and so I was like, okay, let's, let's figure out a way to, to explain this, and this is what I'm going to be, uh, this is kind of a, the, the root cause for this talk, which has a second subtitle, like hidden title, uh, which is cleaning and tidying children's rooms. Now, that comes from the fact that I myself, a parent, uh, have three kids, and my kids are at the age where you tend to go and tell them, you know what, you have to clean your room, uh, and they look at you and say, like, what do you mean, my room's clean? Uh, and I, I realized that the type of conversation that I have with my kids regarding of like making them do something, it's pretty much conceptually the same conversation I have with developers. Like I go to a customer, look at their code, and it's like, you know, this is kind of messy. Like it, it, it would be nice if you clean this code a little bit. And they're kind of like, what do you mean? It's, it's perfect, it's like clean code. Like, okay, fine. Um, so, this is how I was like, okay, let, maybe this is going to be a good idea to actually try to explain this to, to people. So how do you approach this with kids? You approach it with examples. Like, okay, oh, let me show you, let me explain why. And you don't, give, you don't throw buzzwords at kids, right? You basically say, you know, if you put this stuff here, you know, it may be hard to find later on, or it may fall down and break and so forth, and they get to understand why. Um, how do you do this with developers, though? How many of you have heard of Conway's Law? Oh, and it is like my constant surprise. Every time I go to a conference and I ask these questions, I see no more than 10 hands going up. And in the era of microservices, one would think everyone should be familiar with the Conway's Law, but apparently it's not the case. So, okay, Conway's Law says that any organization that designs a software system inevitably is going to design a system that represents the company's organizational, the organization or company's communication structure. And in other words, in whichever way to communicate inside your organization, these will be the processes that will be used inside your software. Uh, and it's a very popular uh, thing to, uh, these days. So one thought struck me. Like, if that's true, we can reverse it. So that's my reverted Conway's law, and basically says, well, if, if that's the case, then we can get pretty much any software, 
and try to represent it as a company. Uh, and then we'll see how the things that we're talking about in software all of a sudden become obvious. Uh, the source code is in GitHub, and I'm going to really rush through the source code, and it's not the point for you today here to understand every single line of code. Uh, it's more about how you decompose your application into modules and bits and pieces and how they work together and how you isolate things. So this is what we're going to be focusing about. Um, um, uh, not, not really decode itself, but if you want to play with it later on, it's on GitHub. Uh, so let's start. Let me introduce you to Hari. Hari wants to create a company, and in the fashion of the stock, he's going to be doing house cleaning, right? It's a very simple thing. Hari has a van, he has some tools and cleaning supplies. You call Hari, say, Can you clean my house? Hari comes over, cleans your house, uh, gets the money, goes back. Super simple. Now, let's see how that works. Here is our super simple application. Here is Hari. Um, let me make it a little bit bigger for you. Uh, so Hari is here. He has some cleaning tools and supplies um, and stuff like that. And he can clean houses, OK? So you give him the address and some instructions, some money. He checks whether you've paid him enough. Um, and if so, he grabs his cleaning supplies and tools. And then he gets in the van, loads the stuff, drives to the given address, cleans the house, loads the stuff back in the van, drive, go, drive back to his office, and uh, puts the supply back, uh, and he enters some record in his bookkeeping system. Uh, so you see, there's quite a lot going on here. And if you look into that, this is basically how we, once upon a time, started to learn to code. Like, and it's super cool. Like, uh, it's hurry. It's all hurry, so you can do all stuff. So let me just real quick run this for you. Uh, it's house cleaning one. And I have, OK, so before I run this, though, uh, I have this thing, and it's in every example. It's client thing. This is basically just so I can call methods uh, uh, and functions on classes. So don't, don't bother with understanding that. So I'll run this. I have a script. Uh, run, and when I run this, I need to say which Java version I want to run with, uh, and it's going to be Java, let me make this bigger for you, it's going to be Java 8 for now, you'll see why it is important later on. So here it is, running with Java 8, so I can say, hey, hurry, clean the house, and Kari is going to grab the stuff and, you know, do, follow the algorithm, uh, whatever, um, super cool. Now, if you think about this, uh, it's uh, pr not probably what you're going to use today to write an application, but again, this is how we once upon a time wrote our first apps. And it's pretty straightforward. And I would argue that it has one significant advantage over every single other example that you will see, and that is everything is in one place. Now, whatever happens, it's in here. It's hurry. If you want to change something, you have to change Hari. If something breaks, it's Hari. You don't have to look anywhere else. It's all here, right? You don't have to spend weeks of debugging and looking for stuff you know, all over the internet. It's all in one place. Of course, this is not evolvable. Of course, this is not scalable. And of course, you don't write applications this way uh, because you want them to evolve. And this is what Hari comes to realize at some point in time. So he goes like, nah. Um, uh, let's look around the uh, market, what other people are doing. So he gets this thing called Smart Garage. So Smart Garage is basically a garage where you can do things like select from my cleaning tools where blah, blah, blah. Not that Harry really needs a Smart Garage. It's just that everyone else is using Smart Garage or, you know, so he kind of uh, like follows the trend. Uh, right? And he also gets his friend Ronald to help him out. You know, so Ronald's now dealing with the customers. Uh, he comes up with this thing called order form. So a customer can fill up an order form, send it to Ronald, and Ronald uh, somewhere here is going to pass it to, uh, to the hurry uh, and so forth. And one thing I forgot to mention in the previous example uh, is that Harry is also a person. Right? And so, so now that Harry has a van, he can actually borrow his van. 
Uh, so here we back to example one. Um, and he checks if you, the person that wants to borrow the van is a friend, and if it's a, van, if it's a friend, he can borrow the van, otherwise he will say, no, I'm sorry. Uh, so while we are still at example one, let's just try that. I can say, borrow the van, and Harry says, I don't know you. I say, what do you mean you don't know me? I'm a friend, and Harry borrows me his van. Now, I go to get the van, go to vacation, Harry's out of business, but that's a different story. It's Harry's decision. Okay, so, but now we want to keep the same logic, and, and um, in, the, in this example too, uh, you can see that actually Ronald has borrow van and borrow tools uh, methods. So if we go here uh, and say go to uh, house cleaning, where are you, please? Example two. Uh, okay, uh, and run this with Java 8 again. Uh, I can say clean house, and you will see Smart Garage is now figuring out what tools I need and, and, and supplies. Uh, and Ronald is actually the one who is taking the order and passing it to Harry. Everything else is the same. But if I now say, borrow the van, um, here it is. It doesn't ask me if I'm a friend or not, because at the end of the day, it's Ronald that rents me or gives me or borrows me the van. Harry doesn't even know uh, uh, about it. And if I say borrow the tools, uh, that's pretty much the same, uh, the same situation. Now, how come this is possible? Well, this is, part, this is basically the diagram of what we just designed. So Harry is now hidden from the customers. They don't talk to Harry, they talk to Ronald. And there is this garage thing that has all the stuff in it. Uh, but now Ronald is totally okay with bypassing Harry. And why is that? Because they are, in terms of Java, they're all in the same package. In terms of company, they're all in the same room, building, whatever. Uh, so Ronald can do stuff just around Harry without Harry knowing it. And obviously, that's not something Harry is very comfortable with. Now, for as long as it's only Ronald and Harry and their friends and everything works together uh, and everything works fine, it's totally fine. But if you want to grow a company this way, you don't really want every single employee of your company to be able at any time to get everything, anything and give it to anyone, right? You still you need to enforce some kind of procedures in there, right? Um, so Harry is going to change the stuff uh, a bit and says, nah, that's not going to work this way. Uh, let's go to this example three. And he looks at the market, and uh, companies are structured different ways. So he goes like, OK, I'm going to have this package here with a project called assets. And I'm going to put all the garage and the storage in there. Uh, right? And I'm also going to have this thing called company. Uh, which is where I am, Hari, uh, and I'm going to have an assistant, but Andre, you will see it's not public, it's not available to anyone, it's just for me to, to work with is my assistant, right? Um, and also, I'm going to have this thing called front office, and in the front office, there's going to be Ronald with his form and stuff like that. So clear separation, modules, right? It's super cool. Um, so let's try that. Uh, and we're going to go now to house cleaning three, run that again with Java 8. So it all works fine again. Clean the house. Yeah, Ronald's getting the order. Andre prepares the tools, blah, blah, blah. Pretty much the same thing. Now let's borrow the van. Hey, here is the same thing again. Now, you can argue that, oh, wait a minute, but that's because in our assets, we didn't, uh, we made this public, right? See, our garage is public. So I can just go and say, nah, it's not public anymore. Uh, but then again, you, you, you know, Ronald cannot ask it, uh, access it anymore, but so cannot Harry nor Andre. So it's kind of blocking it for everyone. So you can't do really, you can't really do this. Um, uh, you have to keep it public. Um, so in terms of, uh, what happened here? Uh, okay. 
In terms of diagram, this is basically how the things work. So you now have separated the stuff into you know, uh, uh, modules or packages, or whatever you want to call them, uh, right? But because you have the garage and the storage separate, and they need to be available for Hari, uh, they are also available for Ronald. So he can bypass Hari anytime he wishes, uh, right? And you may be like, no, I've never done this. Like, this is so wrong. Uh, trust me, you've done this many, many times. This is what we all used to do, and this is what I call the BBC software architecture, which is the box box cylinder. And we were taught to build software this way for many, many years. Now, you don't call them box box cylinder, you call them front end business logic database, or you call them whatever else, but this is essentially how we've been building software for decades, uh, right? It would just you know, switch the what, what names we use for that. So, okay, that doesn't really work the way Harry wants. Uh, one second, my mouse is gone again. Um, so, let's go to another, uh, another example. Uh, let me hit, uh, clean this here. Um, so, in this example, we're going to have a, sep a different uh, 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 way of structuring the company. So, we're going to have the company, and inside the company, there's going to be Hari and his garage. So, pretty much the same thing. And we're going to have this thing called back office. And Andre goes to the back office, so he's now in charge of all the stuff. Uh, so, no one can access the storage. You see, the storage is uh, package private. Uh, and so, only Andre can access it. And so is the garage. Only Hari can access it because they're in the same package. And in the front office, we now have, again, Ronald and the order form. So let's do this. House cleaning four. Uh, clear the screen. Let's make it bigger for you. And run this with Java 8 again. Uh, and I'll do clean house. Uh, man, totally works the same way we used to see it works. If I now say borrow the van, well, I can't. And the reason I can't is if you look into what Ronald is doing here, in order for him to access the van, he actually has to, has, to, ask, to ask, has to ask Hari, right? But Hari has the logic of, hey, are you a friend of mine? And since you're not, you can't borrow the van. So it's super cool, right? Except what, what happened this time is we can say, borrow me your tools. And here we go. Now we can steal the tools. How can that happen? Well, that's the next example. This is like we have one thing that protects all the other things, right? So Andre is protecting the storage, and Harris is protecting the garage, and Ronald can only talk to these two entities over there, uh, right? And it's super cool. Well, except nothing prevents Ronald from talking straight to Andre, uh, which is probably not what you intended because he cannot check whether you're friend of Harry or not. Uh, so you are still into a situation where you can bypass things. And again, this works for these three entities. Now when you get 300 entities or 3,000 entities, uh, this becomes a little bit messy. And this is what I call the universal microservices architecture. Um, this is how we uh, uh, are taught to build software tour today, um, uh, which is throw everything in one thing, like put it in a Docker container ideally, hold JVM in it, and you know, isolate the world and put a RESTful service on top of it. And then you have like millions of RESTful services talking to each other, um, and each of them has to have like lots of logic to figure out whether they are doing something wrong or not. Not necessarily that this is a wrong approach, but as you can see, there are some shortcomings with it. Um, okay, so maybe maybe there is a better way to do this. So let's go to the uh, next example. And in this case, um, we're going to have a different situation. So we're going to have the company, and Harry comes to the, the point where he realized, yeah, I've been structuring all my companies around entities, like Harry and Ronald and, and stuff like that. Maybe I should think more business why? More in, into business terms, right? So now he goes and, and divides internally his company into things like assets, which is like software or storage or vehicles, whatever. 
He defines job positions, and in here we have an accountant, and you can see those are not classes, those are interfaces, those are definitions. It doesn't say how they do things, it just says what their responsibilities are. Um, so he has an accountant, an assistant, a cleaner, uh, whatever. Uh, and then he has some processes. So here is a clean house process. Basically says, call the cleaner and let them clean the clouds. Or you have here transport process, which says get the van, load the stuff, drive to a location, um, or, and so forth. It also uh, has like shared stuff, like uh, all this separation thing uh, causes uh, that different uh, kind of departments, so-called, need to talk to each other. So they need to share things like, you know, like something was wrong, they need to communicate. So here is like cleaning instructions and uh, like how you communicate, you haven't been paid enough and stuff like that. And then here is the staff. Here is Andre, who is an assistant. Uh, here is Hari, who is both cleaner and accountant, as ridiculous as it sounds. Uh, and here is Ronald, who is a receptionist. So this is the internal structure of the company that nobody but the people in the company care about. And this is this thing, okay, sorry, this is the, uh, the, the, the question now is how do we make use of that company, what this company offers to, and this is where the use cases comes from. Uh, and here we have one use case, which is called um, uh, clean customer house, or customer use cases, clean customer house. And in here we say, okay, what does this mean? Like whenever people want their house to be clean, uh, we're gonna have, uh, we're going to use these processes. So first, we're going to do the new order process, which is like checking the payment and stuff like that. Uh, then we're going to have um, some pre prepare process to pick up tools and, and stuff. Uh, then there is a transport process, then there is a clean house process, and then there is a transport process to go back. So this is basically a, a way of like how we use the resources that our company provides to get the job done, right? And then we still have the front office, and the front office is basically uh, just making use of the uh, use cases, or not this one. So in here, we just get the customer use case and say, this is what we want, uh, and, and we're done. Uh, okay, so let's try that. Uh, make it bigger for you. Run this with Java 8 again. So clean house, and I've changed it a little bit so we can now pass some money. So clean my house for 10 euros, and the process goes like, no, that's not enough. Uh, so 110 euros, it's probably okay. Uh, and you can see that still, even though we go through our company processes and use cases and stuff, it ends up with Ronald and Andre, and it basically does the exact same thing. So can we now say um, borrow the van? Sure we can. Uh, can we borrow the tools? Sure we can. Why? Okay, this is this example. So we've kind of decided that we're going to divide things internally, and we're going to have these like job positions and processes and share things and stuff like that. We have the use cases, and by having the use cases, there isn't one significant advantage. We acknowledge the fact that with all these different resources that we have internally in the company, we can actually use them in different ways. So this is currently one use case, which is clean house, but we could theoretically use the exact same company resources to do, I don't know, clean backyards or clean pools or whatever use case comes to our mind uh, to develop our business further. Um, so we kind of opened the door for future use cases. And then we have this front office, which is making use of the use cases, but we also not tied to the company itself, but rather to the use case. So this opens the door for us us to provide different um, uh, front office uh, abilities. Like if, if you want to do like a, a on a on not people coming to your office but calling you on the phone or you know through the internet or restful or whatever comes to your mind. Still, the problem here is that because we have all this, even though it's, inter it's divided, everything in this company thing, it's available to everyone. So, there is nothing that prevents front office to go straight to the company and grab the van or grab the tools. Uh, and uh, this is a problem. We need to fix that. How do we fix that? This, you can try to do some stuff package private in here, but then you're gonna, use cases cannot use it. So it's like, 
it's kind of a problem, whatever we want to do. Um, so here is the solution for that. Uh, and in, in this use case, this is, uh, six is pretty much the same as five. Uh, the only difference in here is that if you look inside the code, we've put some stuff into this package called internal, right? So, and, and of the intention is obvious, we want to hide this, right? So we have the assets, the shared stuff, uh, and the people as internal things that no one cares about. We have job positions and processes as exposed to the world, um, right? And, Mm, uh, and the same thing is with like use cases. I'm sorry. Uh, we just use the stuff that we uh, that we want to use. So how do we enforce that internal thing though? Uh, let's see. Uh, oops, we still here. So I'm gonna go to example six, um, and I'm gonna now compile this. Uh, Okay, clean, just to make sure. Uh, and I'm gonna compile this with Java 8. Um, and you will see that it compiles just fine, and I'm gonna run this with Java 8. Um, and um, I'll do the same thing here, just to make sure that it, there's no difference. Can I borrow the stuff? Sure I can. Okay, nothing happened in here. Well, let, let's try something different now. Um, let's build this with Java 9. And if I try to build this with Java 9, uh, it's gonna fail. And it's gonna fail and it's gonna tell me that I cannot access a package internal assets in here. Why is that? Because of this, so, uh, thing called JPMS, Java Platform Modular System. Uh, and in here, we have this module info file. And in this module info file, we've defined that we export those three packages, job positions and processes and shared. And uh, we do require some other stuff, but that's not really important at the moment. Um, the important part is nothing else but these three packages are visible to anyone out there. And so the moment you try to reach to anything that is in a package that is not exported, you get the compilation error. And even if you manage to cheat it and compile it, you're gonna get a runtime error. So there is no really a way around that. So now the only thing that you can do is you go to your front office, uh, and in here, you say, well, yeah, I can't actually. Well, our company doesn't really borrow vans and tools, so this is not a business case. So, sorry, you can't do this. And now, because Java, JPMS, it's not really smart, and every time it sees an import, it thinks that you are actually using it, so you have to comment out the imports anyway. Uh, so now, the moment you do this, uh, you'll be able to actually compile this with Java 9. Uh, and now it's the time where all of your stuff is actually protected. Now, the problem is here, you can't run this with Java 8 anymore because you have a modular system which is not supported, so you have to run this with Java 9, ideally on the, modular path, on the module path, and so clean house, it works. Uh, borrow van, doesn't, and this is exactly what we wanted. So after some attempt, like Harry is, okay, I finally get my company to be like functioning in the way I want it. Um, but now he comes to think like, hey, what's gonna happen if my van breaks? Like, wait, wait what, I, what do I do? I never thought of that before. Um, so if you look into the code, of the transport process, which is uh, processes, transport process. In here, we have this method is van functional, and we check a property file just to simulate that the van is broken. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna go to this example, open this uh, property file, which should be somewhere here, uh, okay. Where it is. Uh, 
status. And I'm just gonna say my van just broke. And, uh, okay, and if I say now clean house, what do you think is gonna happen? Says, whoops, sorry, I don't, I can't, you know, do anything because I don't have the van to go to your house, so we're now broken. And now the only thing that you can do is just wait for them to repair the van. Now that's not a good business model. You don't want to do that. You want to be able to actually react to that in, in a time, uh, in a better, uh, better way. Um, so let's try to actually structure this company a little bit different, and this is what Harry, Harry tries. So looks at the company again, uh, and uh, we're gonna now say, uh, okay, you know what? Those processes are actually process definitions. So if you look at the transport process, it's now a process definition. It's not the exact process, it's basically say, well, this is what a transport process is supposed to do, and I don't really care how. And internally, you have a process implementation, which in some way here says, well, if you are a transport process, this is how you do. You load the van and you go do stuff. Now, what this allows us to do is to go to some third party, like Uber, and say, hey, Uber, if my van broke, so I want you to give me a ride. Uh, and so then you implement a Uber process, a Uber transport process, which is the exact same process, except you order a Uber van and, you know, kind of works a little bit different, but the end result from company perspective is the same. Um, now, how this gets to work together? Well, let's look at the module info again. And now, in here, we have these things here called, it says, provides new order process with internal, internal order process, provides transport process with internal transport process, and so forth. So this is where we define like, how these things are actually uh, implemented. And if you look into Uber transport, it does the exact same thing. It provides transport process with Uber transport process. How do we use that? Uh, if you look into our use case now, uh, which is here, uh, settings, use case, customer use cases. So this is how we load the processes. We use this thing called service loader. How many of you are familiar with service loader? Hands up, one, two, three, three, four people. That's my second biggest surprise. Service loader is something that showed up in Java 6. And it's been very, very well, uh, very, very unknown feature for some reason. I don't know. Uh, but service loader is one of the things that is, uh, in my opinion, going to become very popular with Java 9 and JPM, Java versions after 9 in Java Platform Modular System. Uh, and basically what we do here is we just use service loader to load implementation of these interfaces and say, give me a transport process uh, that matches this criteria, blah, blah, blah. So how do we do now this? So well, in, unfortunately, um, uh, Java, uh, Java JPMS is not dynamic at all. So when we go to house cleaning seven now, and we're gonna just start it the way, the way it is. Uh, let's run it with Java 9 modular system, uh, and say clean house, it works. Uh, let's break the van, uh, and it's gonna say, I can't. And in order for you to fix this, is you have to shut down your application, you have to find the way that the way this started, um, which is here. Uh, sorry, no, not here. Uh, Java run here, and you have to put your other module on the module pod. So unless you started your application with the Uber module, there's no way to audit it uh, later on. So you have to restart your application, but you can do that. And now when we restart our application, uh, let's, do, uh, let's do this. So I can say now clean house, and you'll see that instead of 
our own van, we're now using Uber uh, service, but in the meantime, they may fix our van. So if they do, we're going to use our van again. So we now, given that we started the application with a, a set of options, we can now actually uh, reactively um, uh, change the behavior uh, depend on what's going on. Um, now, that is, uh, that is good, uh, and um, it is basically, okay, uh, this is the six, which I skipped for some reason um, to show you. So this is where we actually hide those things, uh, and we are now here. Um, it's the game, we hide the things so you cannot access them anymore. But not only that, we now expose whatever we need to expose as services. Uh, and from your use case perspective, you're not dealing with concrete classes anymore. You just go to this services thing, say, give me a service that does this. And you get the implementation of that service, or you get an information there is no such service or it's not available at the moment, and you handle it. So you are in charge now to, to decide what's going to happen if the van's broken, if there's other services missing. You have full control of how your application or how your company functions. Um, so you may now ask, okay, but what if I can't go to Java 9, JPMS, and what if I want to be dynamic? Uh, well, Turns out you don't have to do this with Java 9, and you don't have to be dynamic. There is another way to do that. Sorry, there's another way to do that, and it's called OSGI. Um, and this is what example eight is going to show you. So in this case, we have very much the same situation. So we have the company, uh, and we have the uh, processes again. And we have the implementations of those processes. And if you look into the internal transport process, um, we just say this is a component. Now, what we are using here is a, uh, a component framework called declarative services. So this thing basically registers this as a service of type transport process into a service registry. That is everything it does. And so are the other things, like internal uh, uh, processes and so forth. Um, and that's pretty much the only difference, apart from the uh, Maven build stuff, which I'm not going to show you, but it's pretty straightforward if you look into the code. Um, then we have this uh, use cases in here, uh, which is using the reference annotation to basically say, well, get me a clean house uh, process service from the service registry, whichever way it is implemented. Uh, and for the um, transport process, we say, well, I actually uh, want this to be dynamic. I want to be notified when processes show up and disappear from the service registry. And the logic it's in here, even though there is a much simpler way to do it, but I didn't want to bother you with OSGI-specific stuff. So it's, it's the same thing here. Get the, the, all the processes and figure out which one you want to use. Um, if you look into the Uber transport, it's exactly the same thing. Um, it just registers itself as a service that provides a transport process. That's pretty much it. Uh, there is no module info. There is no requirement in Java 9, uh, none of these things. Now, if you wonder why we still have um, uh, things here like run, uh, this is basically uh, the easiest way to assemble OSGI applications. Is just uh, We just have a POM file here, which basically says, get all those dependencies and build a single executable job file out of them. And this is what we're going to run at the end of the day. And because we are also using this other things, uh, uh, um, module uh, where all this like van and tools come from, and this is not an OSGI module, so we need to make it an OSGI module. And making it an OSGI module is just one line basically says, well, this is what we want to export from it, uh, and uh, a palm file that's going to repackage it, uh, and that's pretty much it. Um, so that's why we have a couple more modules in here, and uh, let me go now. Uh, and run this. Now, the uh, shell that you're going to see is going to be a little bit different. Uh, what I'm using here is JLine 3, uh, uh, the standard uh, shell. For uh, the OSGI, there is a GoGo -Go shell, which is based on top of JLine 3, which is pretty much the same thing, but there's more stuff in there, so don't get confused. So I'm going to run this with Java 8 again. 
Uh, and if I can actually now see what modules are running inside my system. Uh, so you can see we have the client, the company, the front office, and, and there is no Uber module in here. Uh, I can say now clean house uh, for 100 euro, and you see it all works the way it's supposed to work. So what's, happen, what's gonna happen if my van breaks? Um, let's try that again. Uh, so clean the house, and it says, well, I don't have a transport process. Oh, really? So um, can say install, and here is my Uber process. Uh, target, here goes. Install that for me, please. And I get an ID. This is where the ID of the module. So if I do this, you will see, oh, yeah, we have a new module installed. It's not started, so let's start it. Um, here we go. How we, uh, how we stand? Hey, now our Uber transport is active. So I can actually say, now clean my house for 100 euro, and here goes, I can now use Uber. I didn't have to restart, I didn't have to do anything, I just dynamically installed a module which registered a service which my application discovered, was notified, uh, and start using. Um, so if I now say, well, my van just got you know, fixed, uh, I can still go back and use my van. Right, so this is essentially getting to the point uh, where you can dynamically choose what to use under what conditions and react to what happens, uh, right? And this is basically what the LifeRay platform currently does. It registers services of uh, pre-ready services. So we have a bunch of services, like we have a CMS as a service, uh, DMS, you know, workflows, and all kinds of things. And it allows you to build your own services and register them in a pretty much similar way. And when you build applications, you can just build the parts or the services that you want, that you need, and then consume other services and then compose your applications uh, in, in a different way. Um, so I'm not saying that this is the way to build applications, it's a way. Right, and if you think about it, in, in, back to uh, in, in terms of uh, Harry, when we were, when Harry was just doing business from his garage, um, and he was like only him and no one else, it was perfectly fine to have everything in one place. The question is how much you want to evolve from that. If you want to, if you foresee yourself, your company, your, your software as something that's going to evolve and get more and more complicated and more and more complex, doing more and more things, then it makes sense to start thinking about how you actually decompose it into smaller pieces. And not only that, because what I see a lot is when people like chop software, I was like, hey, let's go three files here, five files there, you know, put them in Maven and we have modules. It doesn't work that way. You have to think about boundaries and how they interact and what they expose to each other and what things you want to hide from other uh, stuff and so forth. And I think it all boils down to uh, this thing, uh, naming things. Uh, we, you've heard the saying that there are two hard things in software, um, uh, cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one error. Um, so, what I see happening is that we try to tell people, hey, you need to kind of think of how you do uh, stuff, and they're like, oh, no, we're doing this. We're doing clean architecture. Uh, we're doing you know, ports and adapters. Uh, and then someone else comes and like, no, that's not ports and adapters. That's not clean architecture. Or you don't do microservices unless there is Spring Boot. So what I see is sometimes people, smart people, get together and figure out a solution for a problem that many developers have. And that solution works in particular case, in particular scenarios, uh, maybe wide enough. And so they come up with a name. They call it something. They call it clean architecture, DDD, or reactive, or whatever. 
And once we put a label on it, there's like millions of experts all of a sudden born all over the world that's going to come to you and say, no, that's not reactive. This is reactive. No, that's not clean architecture. This is clean architecture. And then this is like endless arguing about, am I doing this? Or am, I, uh, am I doing clean architecture or not? Am I doing this or am not? It doesn't matter what you are doing, for as, I mean, what, do you, what label you stick on it, for as long as you understand what problem you're trying to solve, what are your boundaries, what are the things things you want to expose, what are the things you want to hide, what are the things that matter for your business case. Really, those are the things you should be thinking about, not what label you're going to stack on it. By the way, how many of you know what DDD is? Okay, you're wrong, because I learned what DDD is when I came to Bulgaria. Apparently, DDD stands for Davai, Davai, Davai. All right. So, with that, um, back to my cleaning room example, um, it's never the case that you're going to tell your kids, clean your room, and it's going to stay clean forever. It doesn't work that way. It's going to get dirty and messy. And it's not why you tell your kids to clean the room so that you have it clean for one day or for one week or for one month. It's you tell them, you explain this, so you want, to, you want them to learn to keep things in order. You want them to learn that it's important to keep things in order because this way, we, uh, the, 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 their room is kind of a safe and livable place. And this is the difference with developers. What we try to do, what we should try, all of us should try to do, is try to learn what is important in code. How do we structure the code? How do we separate it? How do we isolate it? How do we decompose it into modules and libraries and whatever you want to call it, so that your application that's going to evolve over the years is actually a safe and livable place? Thank you. Um, I think we have four minutes for questions according to the clock here. Anyone? I, it's dark, I don't see you, but yeah, they're over there. Uh, if there is no mic, I'll just repeat it after you. Uh, you have the mic. Uh, is it on? Is it on? Yes, it yes. is on. Okay, I've been using OSGI until a couple of years ago, and the whole build system was a mess. I mean, creating bundles, you find a library, you uh -huh. download it, you cannot really use it, you have to turn it somehow into a bundle, and that really, really slow development time. Right. Has this improved at all? I'm sorry? Has this improved at all? Uh, yes, uh, it's improved in, in two ways. Uh, so I've, I've done this, by the way, I've done this myself as well. Like I've done terrible code with OSGI. Um, I've done terrible code with Spring Boot. Uh, and I've done terrible code with pretty much any technology out there which I tried to use and I didn't understand from you know ground up. Uh, and it, it's no different. It, it, it has a learning curve. Um, and uh, the difference is it back until like, I don't know, three, four, five years ago, uh, the tools were lacking. So you had to do a lot of things by hand. Uh, it's not the case today, as you saw, we just throw a bunch of annotations. We have the components frameworks. It's today, writing OSGI is no different than writing Spring applications in, in, in a sense. It's, however, conceptually different because OSGI is dynamic. Right, so if you write anything spring, you, and this is where the problems for people typically start, is because when you used to write spring applications, you know that the moment you wired, you wired once and forever. 
One, if the, the application context or whatever thing is called Spring wires your beans, that's it. Up until the moment you shut down your application, you wire it. Uh, and this is the exact same thing that happens in JPMS. JPMS starts and wires your stuff together. If it can't, it throws an exception, and that's it. And you wire it once and forever. The only difference with OSGI is this is not true. You can be wired and unwired, and things can disappear at any time. And this forces you to think in different terms. All of a sudden, all the knowledge that you have because of years of experience with statically linked stuff, uh, it's no longer relevant. So you have to start thinking in, in terms of like dynamism, in terms of like reactive, uh, and, um, and this is what most people struggle with, and this is where uh, most of the terrible uh, code that you've seen and I've seen and many people have seen with OSGI uh, comes from. So it has improved a lot in terms of tools and in terms of uh, um, uh, technologies like specs and stuff, uh, but also uh, it, it's still dynamic. It is still a different concept than pretty much anything else out there. So it requires a mental shift to, to properly work with it. Does that answer your question? All right, anyone else? Uh, okay, I don't see any more hands, but I'm gonna be around till the end of the day, so if you wanna talk about any of those stuff, uh, just find me and I'm happy to discuss it with you. Thank you very much, guys.